Hey guys, this is Mr. Bradstreet, and welcome to Biology 1, Unit 12.1. In this podcast, we're going to be talking about population ecology, the first of our series of podcasts on ecology and ecosystems. So if you remember, organism is the lowest level at this ecosystem level, and then you have populations, communities, ecosystems, and finally all the ecosystems on Earth, biospheres. So what's a population? Well, a population is a group of individuals of the same species, same place, same time. So because they're the same species, they're relying on the same resources, interacting together, and interbreeding. Remember, the, the biological definition of what a species is, is two individuals that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring together. So think about what are some factors that could affect a population? Well, you could have abiotic factors, like some abiotic factors might be sunlight and temperature, or precipitation and water, soil and nutrients. Remember, abiotic means non-living. Or you could have various biotic factors, like other living organisms, prey, competitors, predators, parasites, disease, all of these are things that could influence that population. And there's certain intrinsic factors like uh, adaptations, like whether or not that particular species is even adapted to live in that type of environment. So when we look at a population, there's three main ways that we're going to characterize it. The population range, its spacing, and its size. So we'll look at each of those individually here on the next few slides. So population range is just the geographical limits of the population. And a lot of those are due to the abiotic and biotic factors like um, temperature and rainfall and whether or not that species is adapted to live in that environment. So a polar bear is going to have certain, uh, a certain range based on its physiological constraints, where it can live. Same way with a lot of like rainforest species. They're going to have adaptations that allow them to live in that particular biome, but probably going to have a hard time in any other biome. Now, range can change of a population, and usually it's due to a changing environment. Like, if you look back uh, 15,000 years ago, then during the, the last uh, glacial period, then you could see this particular pattern here, where woodlands were, this is the elevation on the mountain, where woodlands, mixed conifer, uh, alpine tundra, but now, over the last uh, 15,000 years, the forests have basically retreated further and further up the mountain because that's where it's cooler. So 15,000 years ago, the climate was such that those woodlands could exist down here, but now those woodlands don't exist until about two kilometers up the mountain. So the range can uh, change. Okay, number two, the second thing that describes the population is their spacing. And there's three basic patterns that you see in spacing. You see clumped, random, and uniform. And so you can see in clumped, the individuals occur in little clumps, in little groups. Random, they're just kind of scattered all throughout there. And uniform, there's going to be a certain kind of pattern that you see. So the clumped pattern is the most common that you find in nature. So when you look at populations in nature, you'll see like a school of fish, where there'll be some fish here and then none over here. Or a herd of buffalo, there'll be a clump of them here and then none over here. So that's by far the most common you see in nature. Uniform, this is probably the, the rarest that you see in nature. Because it's pretty rare to have kind of a uniform spacing. And usually in nature it's due to territoriality. So these birds have a certain space that they're going to, def going to defend, that they need for their area. And so because of that, since that bird needs that amount of space, then you end up with, they fight each other and, until they all have about the equal distance of space. And then finally, population size. Um, size is only going to change by population based on birth, deaths, deaths, immigration, or immigration. So, remember, immigration means 
coming into the population and immigration means exiting the population. So these are the only ways that the population number is going to change. Okay, now looking at populations, we can also look at some things called survivorship curves. There's three general types of survivorship curves we see in nature, type 1, type 2, and type 3. You can see in a type 1 survivorship curve, there's very low, this is survival or death rate over here, and this is a lifespan. So in a type 1 survivorship curve, very low infant mortality, they live for a fairly long period of time, and then once they reach a certain age, there's a fairly high death rate and they die off. So that's pretty characteristic of humans. Humans, uh, outside of accidents and stuff, generally live for a pretty long time and then around 70, 80, there's a pretty high death rate. Hydras, or type 2 here, have a fairly constant. The chances that they die when they're at 75% of their life is about the same that they die when they're uh, an infant. So there's not really a time period of their life when it's more likely they're going to die than the other. And then type 3, there's a very high mortality when they're young, but once they reach a certain age, chances are they're going to live for uh, a fairly long time. So really high infant mortality, but then low adult mortality. And so this kind of plays into cost of survival versus reproduction. And so what I'm going to show you on this next slide is different organisms have different life history strategies. Remember the, oh, the whole goal of, of life for most animals and plants is to produce the most offspring to the next generation. That's what evolutionary fitness is, getting the most genes onto the next generation. And how they do that depends on the different animals or different plants. There's two general categories for that. There's K-selected and R-selected species. I like to remember that K-selected, I think of K for kangaroo, and in general, they have late reproduction, only a few offspring, but since they have a few offspring, they're going to invest a lot of care in them. So a lot of parental care. So us, primates, most other mammals are like that, where there's only one or two offspring born, but the parents take care of them, and so generally the, they don't die. Are selected, I tend to think, roaches. R for roaches. They reproduce early and often have lots of offspring but never take care of them. So chances are they're gonna they're they're betting on I'm just gonna have lots of babies and chances are a few of them are gonna live. And so it's a trade-off, number of offspring versus survival. Um, what works best for different organisms depends. Like coconuts are more K selected. They're gonna have a few seeds um, but put a lot of energy and nutrients into them. Whereas a lot of weed seeds like dandelions take kind of the R-selected approach of just have a ton and maybe some of them will survive and some of those genes will get passed on. And you can see where that comes back into survivorship curves. A type 1 survivorship curve is kind of K-selection. There's low infant mortality because the parents take care of them. Whereas R-selected is more like a type 3. They don't, parents don't take care of them so there's a lot of death early on, but then once they make it past a certain age, then they're probably okay. Okay, last thing we're going to talk about in population podcast is growth rates. So there's basically kind of two patterns you see of growth rates of populations. First thing you see is exponential. So you can see exponential is kind of as this typical little uh, J shape. So they have this kind of J curve. And you can see where there's a lot of growth going on really fast, takes off really quick in kind of this J shape. But the thing is, there's got to be some limiting factors eventually. So those limiting factors can be density dependent. So in other words, the, the denser the population gets, the more they matter. So things like food, mates, nesting sites, these are all things that are density dependent. The higher the population gets, then the more chances are that that's going to be affected. Um, you might not think of pathogens as being density dependent, but the more individuals you pack into an area, the more likely it is disease is going to spread. Density d independent factors are ones that are usually abiotic, it's like sunlight and energy, temperature. Um, 
rainfall, natural disasters, and other things like that, where it doesn't really matter how dense the population is. If the population's not very dense, then sunlight's going to affect it the same way. If the population is real dense, then it's going to affect it pretty much the same way. Okay, so competition for nesting sites. Do you think that would be density independent or density dependent? It'd be density dependent because, you know, the, the denser the population is, the less likely is it is that you're going to have your prime nesting site choice and you may have to fight other birds to get the best environment that there is. Okay, now exponential growth, though. If you look at that J curve, can populations keep that up forever? Can that population growth just keep going up forever? Well, of course it can't. There's going to be limiting factors. Those are density dependent and density independent limiting factors that are going to come in. And so eventually, it's going to switch over to kind of this logistic growth where the population eventually is going to level off at some point. And the point at which it levels off is known as the carrying capacity. So you can see as in, as the population growth approaches the carrying capacity, it begins to level off. So carrying capacity is just the maximum population size that that environment will support. And so you'll see, rarely though in nature is it nice and neat like that. You can see what happened here with these plankton is their carrying capacity looks like it's somewhere around right here. But as the population went up, they actually, you know, you don't know where your carrying capacity is if you're an animal. And so they actually went above it a little bit, ran out of resources, and then they fell back down and kind of... So you see a lot of times this kind of pattern of going around, somewhere around the carrying capacity. You can also see changes in the carrying capacity based on predator and prey. You can see that in this example, for example, uh, for example here, whenever the snowshoe hare is at a high population, well, not too long later, six months later, then a lot of hares for the lynx to eat, and so the lynx population goes up. But then the lynx eat all the rabbits, and so the rabbit population goes down. Low rabbit population, a lot of the lynx die off, so they go down. No lynx around, the rabbits go up. And so you kind of have this back and forth where when there's a lot of rabbits, there's a lot of lynx. And when there's a lot of lynx, the rabbit starts to go down. And so you kind of see this oscillation pattern. And then last slide here for you guys today. Take a look at the uh, human population growth over the last... 10,000 years or so. So you can see it's pretty steady for a while, started growing around uh, the turn from AD and BC right there. There's a little dip from the Black Death, bubonic plague. But then within the last 500 years, it's just shot up exponentially. So question is, when are we going to reach our carrying capacity? What is the carrying capacity for humans? Um, there's a lot of debate out there where it is. Most scientists say it's probably between um, 8 to 10 billion. But right now we're about 7 billion. And so eventually we would expect to see this population start to level off. 